Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for uh, being here today. And we've got a very special guest. Um, and just a quick housekeeping note. Uh, on Monday, Group 3 will be on call. So remember that Monday, Group 3, we'll be talking about the Clean Air Act. So make sure you do your reading for, for Monday. Um, but today, we're very fortunate to have Dr. John Harding here with us. And Dr. Harding is a trained limnologist. And you can probably tell you guys what, what, that, is, what that is. A bunch of lawyers here in the room. But um, he's got you know, over 30 years of experience in environmental science and natural resource management. And currently, his, uh, his day job is serving as the refuge, refuge manager for the Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge. And has anyone here been to the refuge? Show of hands. I, don't, I didn't think so. Oh, great. Well, I'm awesome. Wow. <laughs> and uh, and I, I have too. So um, we've, got, we've got a couple of us in the room. But really an amazing place. And I think we'll hear a lot about that today and how you know, John was really instrumental in bringing everyone together and creating this, you know, really a, a treasure place that we have here in uh, Southeast Michigan and then with, along with our friends in Ontario, Canada. So in addition to his work at the Refuge, he's also um, on the board of the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy. And previously to that, he served on the, as the river navigator for the Greater Detroit American Heritage River Initiative, which was established by a presidential executive order. Before that, he spent um, over a decade working at the International Joint Commission, the IJC. I know um, in the clinic we talked about the IJC on Monday, but um, that's again the organization that was created out of the Boundary Water Street and uh, really has a lot of oversight over many issues related to the Great Lakes, including water levels, flows. Um, and over, over the years, they've really expanded their focus through the Great Lakes Water Quality Area, which I know John also uh, worked on directly. And today, I think we'll hear a little bit about his most recent book, which is um, Bringing Conservation to Cities. And in addition to that, he's had um, several titles, including tons of articles. But um, his book, Burning Rivers, was a 2011 Green Book Festival winner in the scientific category. And so a very well accomplished author, uh, very knowledgeable on all things related to wildlife here in the region. And I think we're very fortunate to have him here today and fortunate to have him here in the community doing all your great work. So, John, thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's not snowing, where is it snowing right now? Yeah. So one of you have heard of the refuge. Where were you at? Uh, you, you were at Humboldt, or where were you at? Um, we were at the Lyle area, right? Lyle, yeah. So, okay. so we did a, uh, we've done a number of projects on Bella uh, creating common term habitat out there. It's a soft shore I've been here in a bunch of projects. I'm going to talk a little bit, first of all, I want to, uh, what comes to mind when you think of Detroit? I'm going to ask you a question. Come on, help me work with me a little bit. Automobiles. Automobiles. Good answer. What else? Motown. Motown. Music. Fantastic. Yeah. What else? Come on. Sports. Sports. Professional sports. We might win the World Series this year, huh? Right? You know, sports. A lot Detroit of the, River. Detroit River. Usually that's not a uh, not an answer, but it's a good one <laughs> from my perspective. You know, so uh, you know we're, we're known for a lot of things. But uh, um, I'd like to talk to you um, about what we are becoming known for, and that is forming partnerships, public-private partnerships, for. Um, conservation, for environmental protection, and for close to home outdoor recreation. We're trying to put all that together. But I like to explain this to people um, uh, you know, from the perspective of paradigm shifts, you know, a, a significant change in thinking uh, that results in a completely uh, changed view or outlook. Think of what the printing press did to create a paradigm shift. Think of what your laptop or iPad has done to create a paradigm shift. Well, um, you know, in Europe there was a, a, a fashion demand for fur hats, fur coats and stuff, and they literally wiped out, extirpated beaver from much of Europe, and they could not meet demand. And so 
they came abroad and started looking for it, the fur trade business. And the Great Lakes Basin, including Michigan and Detroit, uh, were a, uh, a major place to get it. And so uh, hundreds of thousands of beaver pelts were exported. You know, not only were we a, uh, a collector of beaver pelts, but we processed them here in Detroit as well. And so we met the needs of the world, literally, based on that. Um, give, give me a hint here. What, what was the way they had to move people and goods before there was rail and, and uh, ships, oh, ships ships on the back right there? How many of you know that uh, at one time there were more ships built in Detroit? Not little ships, not medium ships, but big ships were built here than anywhere in the United States. In fact, during the 1890s, uh, more ships were built in De Detroit along the Detroit River than any city in America. And in 1819, uh, they declared Detroit River a public highway by a federal act. You know, ships like the Edmund Fitzgerald. Uh, amazing. So again, Detroit responded to a paradigm shift and met the needs of the nation and world. And everyone knows the story of automobiles we put the world on, on wheels. And, and um, with the stroke of a pen, the president at that time, FDR, converted all civilian productivity in Metropolitan Detroit to military <coughs> productivity for one single purpose, to win the war. And you can imagine that. So, uh, you know, obviously there are a, a number of unintended consequences that occur from a paradigm shift. Fur trade literally resulted in wiping out beaver east of the Mississippi River. Uh, the uh, uh, Industrial Revolution, the arsenal of democracy, led to substantial oil pollution in the Detroit River. Uh, one of my favorite stories on the Detroit River was 1946 to 48. Uh, the predecessor of US EPA, the Federal Water Control Administration estimated at that time um, about 5.9 million gallons of oil and petroleum products were discharged to the Rouge Detroit River rivers on an annual basis. Uh, it takes one gallon of oil to pollute a million gallons of water. So putting that into perspective, there was enough oil, grease, and petroleum products going into the Rouge Detroit rivers the entire western basin of Lake Erie. All Ohio waters, all Ontario waters, all Michigan waters. It's a lot of water, right? So, back then, it was a cold winter, much like this winter, like, much like our February, not like our January, but much like February. And um, in the Great Lakes, as the upper Great Lakes freeze over, um, the waterfall start migrating south, right? They're looking for food. And uh, the upper Great Lakes froze over, and they were coming down, and much of the Detroit River was frozen over in 46 through 48. Um, there weren't as many industries. There weren't as many power plants. Um, and so there were only a few pockets of open water on the Detroit River. And what was in those pockets of water? But oil. So literally thousands of uh, ducks and geese landed in these pockets of open water with oil and died immediately. A group of duck hunters from the lower Detroit River uh, were so offended that with the loss of these waterfalls that they collected their oil-soaked carcasses in these pictures, put them in their pickup trucks, and drove to Lansing, Michigan, the top picture is the capital, and they started throwing them on the sidewalk. If you look closely at the sign of the upper picture in the lower right-hand corner, you can read Detroit River, 1948. They started throwing them on the sidewalks and steps of, of the capital and called a press conference and, you know, pulled the governor out of them and, and said, how dare you do this to the place we call home, the place where we recreate, the place where we raise our family. And now, looking back, 
this group of concerned doctors um, are credited for starting the Industrial Pollution Control Program in Michigan. And it started on Detroit River. Pretty cool story. Uh, a little while later, 1965, Time Magazine, one of the lead stories was Lake Erie was dead. It was actually poor journalism at the time. Um, the, the, the lake was more alive than ever with phosphorus. Um, just like what's happening in the Maumee River right now in Toledo, um, uh, high levels of phosphorus are going in and causing algal blooms. The algal blooms settle out into the water. Um, they start decomposing in the lower portions of the lake. They use up all the oxygen. The lower waters go anaerobic. The fish die. The algal, the algae, the algal blooms start windrowing ashore with the dead fish. They close the bathing beaches. They went anaerobic and smell like rotten fish. So back then, um, you can imagine, front end loaders were coming in and removing, decomposing algae and dead fish uh, from there and putting them in dump trucks and taking them. That was Time Magazine. The speed story was Lake Erie was dead. That's Detroit River, a major source for the Detroit River. A picture. Protests started in the 1960s, and people started, you know, uh, protesting. And literally in downtown Detroit, people started talking about this in the 60s before Earth Day. It's a really neat part of our history, and this is what they were protesting. This is the confluence of the Rouge River going into the Detroit River. That tall lobe there is the submerged discharge point from one of the largest wastewater treatment plants in the United States, the Detroit Wastewater Treatment Plant. This is a, a steel company along the lower Detroit River. That's what it looked like. This is the 60s now, you know. A pickle of waste from steel companies. Oil, anything and everything was growing, going into the river. Then finally in 1969, uh, the Rouge River was one of four rivers that caught on fire during that time. And uh, um, uh, this is the last remaining picture in the lower one right here. That's the Ford Motor Company stacks. That's the draw bridge on the Rouge River. It's kind of a grainy picture, but that's the John Kendall Detroit's fireboat putting out a fire on the Rouge River, the lower Rouge River, uh, uh, because of oil Insult to injury, we were not done with uh, what, what we were doing to the place we call home. And in 1970, there was a graduate student from the University of Western Ontario. He came over from Scandinavia. And he was interested in mercury pollution because up there, um, uh, fish were accumulating high levels of mercury in the lakes. And, um, and he was interested because we had petrochemical valley in Sarnia, Ontario, and we had chemical plants on the Detroit River, like Wyandotte Chemical Company. They were making chlorine and caustic soda, and the byproduct was elemental mercury. And he was saying, you know, before the Clean Water Act, what was happening to this elemental mercury? It was being discharged into the St. Clair River into the Detroit River. So he went out and analyzed the fish. And he analyzed fish from Lake St. Clair first. And it came out at three parts per million, or milligrams per kilogram. That's six times the safe standard for human consumption. And so he presented his data to the federal governments of Canada and the United States. And of course, they said, you're only a graduate student. You're only a graduate student. You better go redo your study. So he went out. Sampled again, and it came out comparable. So then they said, "Well, we better have our agencies look into this." So they went out and they analyzed the fish, and it came out comparable <coughs> levels. The result of that was the mercury crisis of 1970. Literally, they had to shut down all sport and commercial fishing from the St. Clair River through Lake St. Clair, through the Detroit River, to Western Lake Erie. Ban human consumption of fish. That was in our backyard. And that was the mercury crisis. So, um, so when you think of Earth Day, what do you think of? Where, what city or state do you think of? Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor. Or before that, in 
Madison, Wisconsin was a big place. Uh, Los Angeles, UC Berkeley, you know. You don't think of the very first Earth Day in Detroit, but Detroit had a huge role in the first Earth Day. This is a picture. What's in the background right over there on the left, upper left hand corner? Smile, Detroit people. Help me out. What buildings are those? Bob Scott. Uh, building around Cobo Hall there. there. Yeah. Yeah, Cobo there and stuff. So one boat, you know, Chris Craft here with the US flag is the UAW. This boat had a Canadian flag, and it's the CAW, the Canadian Auto Workers. So they decided they were so offended. Their workers spent 50 to 60 hours a week in a factory working to support their families. When they got home, what did they want to do? They wanted to go out and enjoy the outdoors. So they, people working in factories, love, a lot of them love the outdoors, especially back then. And so they would become anglers hunters, and they loved the outdoors, and they were offended at what was going by, going on. So they held a wake on the Detroit River and put in a reef and made national headlines on Red Cross. And so in the same sentence as Madison, Wisconsin, Berkeley, you know, you've got Detroit having a major role for the very first Earth Day of 1970. So you look at that, I told you there was a waterfall die up in 19. 1948. There were major ones of 10,000 or more ducks and geese dying in each of 1960 and 1967. You had Silent Spring, which is Rachel Carson's book, which would awaken everyone to indiscriminate use of chemicals, eutrophication of Lake Erie, Lake Erie is dead, for burning the Rouge and Cuyahoga Rivers in the Mercury Place in 1970. That all led to an incredible amount of legislation. From the Canada Water Act of 1972, the Clean Water Act of 72, the Canada the US Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement of 72, the Endangered Species Act of 1973, and of course a Earth Day that still goes on. So what an accomplishment for all that, all catalyzed by citizens caring about their home. It's been over four decades of pollution prevention and control under this, under the Canada the Water Act, the Clean Water Act, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, and others. Um, so what has happened in the Detroit River? We're almost like a, you know, a bellwether for the whole Great Lakes and the whole continent. Um, we've seen substantial reductions in oil discharges and spills have, uh, uh, have occurred, and winter duck kills due to oil pollution have been eliminated. We've spent literally billions, billions with a B, dollars on uh, municipal wastewater treatment plant and all plants now have um, all major ones one million gallon per day or greater have secondary treatment for phosphorus removal we've seen over a 90 percent decline in phosphorus concentration in Lowy, the detroit river uh, since 1960 there has been an 80 percent reduction in the untreated volume of combined sewer overflows uh, from communities in southeast michigan in old communities like Rochester, New York, and Buffalo, and Toronto, and Cleveland, you have combined storm and sanitary sewers. There are big rainfall events. It, over, it exceeds the carrying capacity of sewers and overflows waste, untreated, into receiving water bodies, whether it be rivers or lakes. And so we've seen an 80% reduction in untreated waste. Uh, between the 60s and 80s, there was over a 4,000 metric ton decrease in chloride loadings in the Detroit River from changes in chemical processes. There's been a 70% decline in mercury contamination in fish since the mercury crisis. That's good. A 90% decline in DDT in fish. A 90% decline in DDE, which is a breakdown product of DDT, a pesticide, and an 85% and PCBs and herring bell eggs from island in Detroit River called Fighting Island. And we've done over a million cubic uh, meters of contaminated sediment remediation at a cost of $154 million. This is all in our backyard. These environmental improvements are really hard to 
a wonderful story. That's not the story I want you to remember. The story I want you to remember is this. The ecological recovery, ecological response. We went literally 25 years with no bald eagles reproducing in this watershed. They tried, they, they tried to reproduce. Eggshell came, no young could be hatched, or young, if they did hatch, they couldn't fledge into the nest. So we went 25 years with no bald eagle reproduction. We now have, in 2013, we have 22 active nests in the watershed, including right on Tesh Isle, and they fly over the Detroit River Road. It's pretty amazing. On Fighting Island, on Humbug Marsh. Amazing. Uh, uh, again, just like bald eagles, peregrine falcons suffered from DDT pollution, fieldrin, and other organochlorine pesticides. And they went uh, over 20 years with no reproduction. Uh, uh, and literally, they brought, they reintroduced peregrines to Detroit and built hacking boxes, you know, these nesting structures uh, in down, on the skyscrapers in downtown Detroit. And now uh, 10 young are, are fledged each year. And they've even expanded their range to the Ambassador Bridge now. It's like a tourist attraction in Windsor. They actually have spotting scopes and they try to time and predict when the young are going to leave the nest first and they name them. And it's quite a tourist attraction, but it's a, a wonderful story of recovery. Osprey. Um, Osprey have nested for the first time in Wayne County since uh, 1890s. So, uh, um, too young from a cell phone tower on our Gibraltar wetlands unit, and they fish on the Detroit River. Amazing, amazing story. Lake sturgeon. Um, there's a substantial decline in lake sturgeon due to building of the shipping channels. We destroyed their spawning habitat. We destroyed their nursery habitat, all these wetlands, a 97% decline. We overfished them. We treated them like a trash fish. So we literally, their population numbers decreased for less than 1% of their historical abundance. And no sturgeon spawning was reported between the 70s and 1999. Then in 2001, they found them spawning in one place, the Detroit River, it's the most unusual place off of Zug Island. Zug Island is the industrial heartland. It's where Henry Ford consolidated all operations. He would never predict it, but they spawned on some coal centers in Carlton. Amazing. First time in 30 years. Uh, um, same thing, whitefish, uh, uh, substantial declines in whitefish. Uh, then in 2006, uh, documented spawning in the river for the first time since 1916. Um, and during the 70s, the walleye population was in crisis for Lake Erie and Detroit River, and now of the walleye capital of the world. We hold the national record for the professional walleye trail, 14 pound walleye from the Detroit River. Um, what the media focused on is even beaver coming back some. Beaver were returned to the uh, uh, main portion of uh, Lake St. Clair watershed and they swam over and um, found a home at the Connor Creek Power Plant at DTE built a lodge and had a number of pups and uh, they've actually expanded it now to six locations in our watershed. You can see them on Bell Island right now. Uh, they could not have survived for many decades because of all that oil pollution from the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. There was so much oil in the river that it would mat their fur. They couldn't thermal regulate. They couldn't survive in the winter. Uh, but they're around now. So if you add that, that up, the return of bald eagles, peregrine falcon, osprey, lake sturgeon, lake whitefish, walleye, it is one of the single most remarkable ecological recovery stories in North America. And that's our background. That's why we're your jump. So, but obviously, we have lots of problems yet. We are nowhere near meeting the long-term goals of the Clean Water Act or the Canada U.S. Railroad's Water Act. So some of our challenges, population growth, transportation expansion, and land use changes. So 
a huge issue in the Southeast Michigan. We continue to lose habitat incrementally uh, in our region. We have the runoff of our roads, of our streets, of our roofs, uh, of our lands called non-point source pollution. We still have the legacy of, of the Industrial Revolution called uh, uh, toxic substances contamination. We've got the introduction of exotic species. We've been ground zero for things like the zebra mussels and quagga mussels coming in on in the ballast water of ships. We've had high water from emerald ash borer was first found here. And of course, we have greenhouse gases and global warming as a challenge. So out of this, out of this recovery um, has come some thinking about changing the perception of who we are as a region, as a watershed, as a shared resource between two countries. So at the time, it was Congressman Dingell, and he would be in Congress back then, and his good friend was Herb Gray, who was the Deputy Prime Minister of Canada, the, uh, like the Vice President. So those two got together and said, you know, they were people of influence. They could open some doors, they could get some money. And they said, why don't you bring together 25 people from Canada, from Windsor, Essex County, 25 from Southeast Michigan, that care about the Detroit River. And if you wanted one thing from us, what would that be? Tell us what you want from us. Do you want us to uh, give you a piece of land? Do you want us to give you a million dollars? What do you want us to do? So we convened and started in 2000 a workshop and we created a conservation vision for the lower Detroit River ecosystem. And it was signed in 2001. You see a whole bunch of people in there. Peter Stroh from Detroit, the number of people who signed it. We said, if you were to create something that didn't exist in North America and gave it legitimacy, gave it this stature in law, everything else will follow. Why don't you International Wildlife Federation. And so Congressman Dingell picked that up and he worked in less than one year to introduce legislation and it was signed in December of 2001 as the first International Wildlife Federation in North America. And one of the few truly urban ones. There are most, when you think of refugees, you think of wilderness. Uh, but there are very few truly urban ones, and we're one of them. And both of them knew, Herb Gray and John Dingle both knew that um, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of land already being used. You couldn't buy a lot of land, you couldn't do a lot of things. They would take working in really innovative public-private partnerships to make things happen and, uh, and, and sort of develop a new paradigm uh, for conservation and do it right here. So John Dingle first set up an acquisition boundary, and that's what you have to do by law. So it went from the confluence of the Rouge River in southwest Detroit all the way to the Ohio border. And you see the polygon on the left of your screen. On the Canadian side, um, they had something much broader. They went from the head of the Detroit River all the way out, including Peely Island and Point Peely National Park, which is that big peninsula that's, you know, sitting out there in the middle of western Lake Erie. So um, um, they're like mirror images, one in the United States, one in Canada. So on the U.S. side, we've created a U.S. registry of lands. And currently, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who I work for, we manage about 5,800 acres uh, uh, for the refuge. We then assign a memorandum of understanding with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources to cooperate in the spirit of the International Wildlife Refuge, I'm growing it. And so uh, they added 7,900 acres, things like uh, Point Pelea State Game Area, Erie State Game Area, Sterling State Park, the registry. On the Canadian side, they've started by adding unique uh, conservation lands and outdoor recreational lands in Essex County from Essex Region Conservation about 3,800 acres to the Canadian Registry of Lands. And then the city of Windsor had things like Pesh Isle and some really cool islands. 
waterfront properties of about 981 acres. So we have about 18,500 acres that we manage right now in the spirit of International Wildlife Commission. Our goal is to grow that to 25,000 in the next 10 years, and that's a very achievable goal. I thought you would appreciate the complexity of working in a big urban area between two countries, two provinces, numerous cities, numerous corporations. So I put this up to sort of frustrate you and intimidate you a little bit, but we have the National Wildlife Refuge System, which is the largest um, organization in the world devoted to conservation of lands. We have more lands than we have 150 million acres devoted to conservation in the National Wildlife Refuge System. We're the National Wildlife Refuge. We do cooperative management agreements with corporations to say there's a power plant like Fermi, and they have they own a thousand acres. They might only use fifty or a hundred acres for energy production, but they have a big buffer around it. So we can manage some of those unique coastal wetlands for wildlife for conservation. So we can sign cooperative management agreements. Um, we have a friends group. We have we've actually set up an organization, a 501c3 organization, to do things we can't do, lobby raise money and to help us deliver our mission. It's called the International Wildlife Refuge Alliance. Underneath them, they've got a, they hold an annual benefit dinner, they raise money, they have a stewardship committee that works year round of volunteers putting much more in cutting invasive base of species, removing them. They've got an education and outreach committee. Uh, there's the Michigan DNR, the memorandum of understanding in the upper left hand corner. Every two years, we hold a conference with Canada. It's called State of the Strait. De Trois is the Strait, so State of the Strait. So it all gets back and forth across the border. One year, it's been here on this campus. It's in Canada. Two years later, it'll be over here. And we tackle an issue, a sticky issue in common to move us forward. Um, we've got, we're one of the three best places to watch hawk migrations in North America, the Lower River. So we have a Detroit River Hawk Watch Advisory Committee. We've got Rose Hill Nature and Land Conservancy that manages a piece of property for us, so called uh, uh, Gibraltar Bay Unit. Um, here's the, uh, what they have in Canada. It's called the Western Lake Erie Watersheds Priority Natural Area. That's their mechanism to get federal governments, the federal government agencies like uh, Environment Canada, Canada Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Others, provincial ones like Ontario Ministry of the Environment, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, local ones like Essex Region Conservation Authority, NGOs like Ducks Unlimited Canada or the Nature Conservancy of Canada, and others to work together. And then we have also a cooperative weed management area where corporations, governments, and NGOs put money into a common pot to do things like Greg Mikey's things that we could do together that we couldn't do separately. Sort of like helicopter spraying with a selective herbicide or frag lighting to prescribe fires over a thousand acres. Some really cool stuff going on. But that's an overview of institutional arrangements. Some of the things we're working on. Um, soft shoreline engineering. Um, hard engineering, hard shoreline engineering would be concrete breakwaters or steel sheet pile that has no habitat value. Soft shoreline engineering, the opposite, is using ecological principles and practices to reduce erosion, achieve stability of shoreline and safety, while enhancing habitat, improving aesthetics, and even saving money compared to steel sheet piling or concrete breakwaters. Um, we did actually a, a conference here in Detroit and brought in experts all over North America, develop the best management practices. And here's some of the things we're doing to demonstrate. That was the shoreline at the Rouge Power Plant. Poured concrete and asphalt, no habitat value. We took it out, we redesigned it, and that's what it looks like today. That's the Rouge Power Plant. Um, an old breakwater at Elizabeth Park, which is the oldest county park in the state of Michigan, owned by Wayne County. Uh, they wanted to take a, this breakwater out and replace it. And we 
said, well, it's going to cost you between $1,600 and $1,800 a linear foot to replace this. You can do that, but could we work with you and do it just as safe, just as stable, and have that to, have to make it more safe easy, and again, save you money from the bottom. We did two ox boats in the river. Really cool. You go to that park. That's where the jazz festival is. You can walk and see that. In total, we've done 53 projects up and down the Detroit River and up in the watershed in the last 14 years. We've taken on a big challenge. We, uh, most national parks have a visitor center and many national wildlife refuges. Where you go to the visitor center, you learn about the national park, the national wildlife refuge, and you decide what you want to do. You want to go out and explore and learn and have fun. Our visitor center is going to be on a brownfield in the city of Trenton. Um, it was, that brownfield is the upper picture. That's in about 1970. It was an automotive brake and paint plant of Chrysler Corporation. They did business there for 44 years. They cleaned it up to industrial standards, put barbed wire around it, and walked away. So it became a classic industrial brownfield, sitting vacant because it was too expensive to clean up. So we took it on and have been spent the last 12 years cleaning up the human health and wildlife standards and expanding it into as a buffer for Humboldt and Marsh. And what is Humboldt and Marsh? This is what it looks like. Here's the master plan. It's the first project in the world to clean up an industrial ground field sufficiently to serve as an ecological buffer for a wetland of international importance under the International Ramsar Convention. Let me explain that to you. Um, Ramsar Convention is an international treaty that was signed for wetlands and it's a voluntary program but they identify wetlands of international importance, not national not state, not provincial, not local, not regional. It has to truly be internationally significant. It's a very rigorous three-year process of collecting data, presenting them to an international review panel, and getting certified to be truly internationally important. Um, that's from Bud Marsh. Um, there's about, there's over 2,000 throughout the world. There's about 30, States and there's one mission and it's Humbug Marsh. And we've been working to clean up this ground field to expand the ecological buffer and build our visitor center. Um, that's what it's going to look like. It's a gold LEED certified visitor center. LEED is leadership in energy and environmental design. Uh, we took our creek out from under the ground, we daylighted it, spoke of daylight. A primary settling basin for storm, storm water and it flows into a secondary treatment basement that will take up more nutrients and then it goes into the Detroit River. Um, it'll have a 775 foot dock in the Detroit River and a world class fishing pier to catch one of those trout. The walleye from shore, creek, you won't need a boat. The school ship run by Michigan Sea Grant will dock there. They'll have a canoe and kayak landing. It's going to be hooked. Riverwalk, the Green Mine System, a community foundation for Southeast Michigan. We're extending up as far down from the road and up to Ann Arbor to Green Mine. It's going to be a pretty amazing thing. Another project. We had something called the Black Lagoon. Can you imagine having that in your backyard? And um, there was a little embayment on the Detroit River, a little back. Water slows down. When water velocities in the Detroit River, again, you have to remember that the Detroit River is like a connecting channel between the upper Great Lakes and the lower Great Lakes. All the water from Lake Superior to Huron and Michigan go through the Detroit River. That's a lot of flow. So to get into a backwater, water velocities would slow down. When water velocities slow down substantially, things would start settling out. Things would settle out. Well, if you go back to thinking back to the arsenal of democracy and all that oil that was coming in. 
we had USDA go out there and do seven cores of 15 feet. And in the middle of that was a big straddle of nothing but oil and grease that they could date back to that time period. So it was still relatively controlled in this small abatement. And um, um, we went, here's a picture of where did that oil come from. This is the uh, Black Lagoon right here. It's a little abatement off the Detroit River. This is McLeod Steel. That photo was 1961. Um, so we throw all the agencies and say, um, there's a risk if you wait on this, and if you have a once in 100 or once in 200 year flood, it could pick up these sediments, push them out in the Lake Erie, and you'll never do anything with it. You know, and that's actually happened on the Saginaw River and Saginaw Bay. And so we were able to convince them to get $9.3 million to remove this while we could take it to an upland containment cell at Point Moye Combined Disposal Facility and um, remediate 115,000 cubic yards of contaminated sediment. A major success story for the Detroit River. And then we renamed it because the community, you can imagine saying, had the black lagoon in your backyard and gave it Elliott's cover after a family that donated some park land to become a park. The sturgeon story. Sturgeon spawned in 1999, the first time on coal cinders off the Southern Island. Um, we then said the root, the quality of the Detroit River is improving enough that it is no longer limiting the productivity of Lake Sturgeon and Detroit River. That's my hypothesis. So if we start building back some spawning habitat, they are lithophilic spawners, rock loving spawners. They spawn rocks. If we were to build something, Potentially, they could spawn. So we worked with Canada. Um, the first ever Canada-U.S. fish restoration project in the United States. I had to send $125,000 of our money to Canada. So you can imagine how sticky that is. To explain it to my bosses, how to transfer money to another country and why. And so uh, we built the reef in 2008, and then the very next spring, out there, they spawn, and it's the first time in that channel in 30 years that Lake Sturgeon has spawned. Uh, this last year, we doubled the size of the reef from the water, and it has worked again. So pretty neat. In total, 16 different organizations, everything from corporations like DTE and EASF Corporation to non-governmental organizations like the Wildlife Habitat Council to um, government agencies on both sides of major success for us. Um, uh, I mentioned in that institutional arrangements diagram, this Detroit River Western Lake Theory Cooperative Weed Management Area, a mechanism for corporations who work with governments who work with non-governmental organizations. So here we, uh, we've got groups like DTE, uh, uh, universities, whole range of them coming together to work together. And uh, we actually bought this really cool piece of equipment called the Marsh Master that can go anywhere, retreat, and restore marshes. Um, so they've, we've uh, uh, been controlling Phragmites and other invasive species on 1,200 acres. Uh, it's a more efficient, effective way of doing it. And we, uh, everything from helicopter application, prescribed fires, mowing, they're using a marsh master. Um, um, and then we have a whole scientific component to measure the effectiveness with governments and universities that literally has saved money for everyone in getting some things done. And of course, it shares knowledge. Um, uh, uh, the grant was awarded We also 
want to engage the people in what we're doing. So we are placing a priority on involving people in monitoring, uh, surveys, and science of the Detroit River of Western Liberia. And one of them is Detroit River Hawk Watch, where for 30 years we pay a professional counter of hawks um, to come in and work with volunteers to systematically and comprehensively count the migration. For example, this last fall, they saw 140,000 broad wing hawks cross the river in one day. That's how unusual the phenomenon is. We do marsh bird monitoring, Christmas bird counts. We have six important bird areas where we do citizen science on monitoring. We've done the common return and habitat restoration on Bell Island. And of course, we've done uh, restoration and monitoring at the Redwood Gateway and Saw Shore Island Michigan. All examples of trying to engage citizens and help create a more informed constituency. Um, our backyard, we have, for the walleye capital of the world, as I mentioned, we have an annual $500,000 tournament on the Detroit River every single spring. $500,000 of prize money in one week. We've held the Chevy Open, a tournament from FLW Outdoors for smallmouth bass, $1.5 million on the Detroit River. That's our backyard. Uh, Ducks Unlimited has identified Metropolitan Detroit. Who would have thought this as one of the top 10 metropolitan areas in the United States for waterfowl hunting? Uh, we are at the intersection of two major flyways. The birds come down from the north and head toward their overwintering sites. Um, we identified 27 exceptional birding spots in southwest Ontario and southeast Michigan. We created a bird driving tour map, modeled that Texas bird driving tour map. It's very cool, it's online, and you can, uh, uh, you can learn about what you can see by season at each of the sites, and it's a very cool thing. We've created a Detroit Heritage River water trail that extends from all of the Detroit River down to Monroe, up the tributaries like the Huron and the Rouge River. And uh, there's now uh, over 30 landings, kayak landings, in place right now on this Heritage Water Trail. If you look back, over what we've been doing in the last, say, 15 years. There's been a number of lessons, and I'll just kind of give you about 10 of them. One of them was to establish a very compelling vision, that conservation vision for the Lower Detroit River system. Something that could resonate with people, something that they could carry in their hearts and their minds. We want to create, we want to change the perception of who we are and where we live. Practice. We need to practice adaptive management, which is assess, set priorities, take action in an iterative fashion for continuous improvement. It's a really important concept. Build partnerships at all level, develop an ecosystem pathway through broad based education, outreach, and stewardship, connect people with nature, build a record of success, and celebrate frequently quantified benefits, not just the environmental benefits of what we're doing, but what are some of the economic benefits? We've raised $140 million for building the Trevor River Walk so far in downtown Detroit. The return on that investment has been a billion dollars. It's a very important thing to sell where we need to go. Uh, involve the public in all actions to develop a sense of place and instill local responsibility for stewardship. Of citizen science and stewardship. Recruit and train urban change agents and facilitators, and recruit a high profile champ like Congressman Nick or Peter Stroh or someone like that. Those are our lessons learned. Where do one most conservationists want to work? Where? If you were into conservation in the outdoors, where would you want to work? Wilderness. I don't want to work in urban areas, right? 
So think of people like me in my agency. I'm, I'm, I'm one of a few that want to work in urban areas. Most of them want to work at refuges in Alaska, Montana, Idaho, things like that. But we need to challenge each other to step out of our comfort zone. So what percentage of the people in the world live in urban areas? Take a guess. Somebody come up with a number. What percentage of the people in the world live in urban areas right now? 85? 85, no, 54. So, so what percentage of people is the same? What percentage of people in the United States live in urban areas? And it's the same for Canada. What percentage of people in the United States and Canada live in urban areas? It's 80%. That's really high. So I so um, where do you think the next generation of conservationists is going to come from? Who's going to come from rural agricultural areas? From wilderness areas? No, it's going to come from urban areas. So what are we doing as a society to gauge people, to inspire them to become the next generation of conservationists? And this is one quote that I really liked by a renowned landscape architect and industrial designer named William McDonald. There are millions of difficult challenges and delightful opportunities ahead. I think the only constraint is the willingness to dream, to create, hope and feel undefended enough to face the tough questions and ideas that must be fiercely engaged at this moment in human history. If design is the signal of human intention, let me say that again, if design is the signal of human intention, then we must continuously ask ourselves what are we, our intentions for our children, for the children of all species, for all time, and how do we properly boldly manifest that on the best of those intentions. That's our challenge, is to be a leader in the next paradigm shift, which is sustainable redevelopment and avoid the next And I think Detroit can be very much part of that. If you're interested, I just wrote a book on that called Green Conservation in the Cities. Thank you very much. I'll answer any questions you have. Do you have any questions? Go ahead. Sorry, you might have already mentioned this, but what's, what's the legal structure of the agency you work for? Is it like a public private you know, kind of hybrid? Or? What's the legal structure? What's the legal basis for my agency? I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We're nested under the U.S. Department of the Interior. We are part of the federal government. We have a number of acts additional federal acts that we are uh, uh, use, uh, the National Wildlife Refuge System Act, the Refuge Improvement Act. Uh, in particular, in Detroit, we have the Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge Establishment Act. It's a federal act that we use, and we are called to work then in partnership with the state agencies, the provincial agencies, the locals, and to make do all this partnership. Somebody must have a long question. Or is it just too late today? It's not a too tough of a question, but um, you said you did a, you had those cooperation agreements with a lot of different industries. So I was just wondering what the attitude of industry is to um, the refuge, because you are a federal agency, and a lot of times, like federal environmental agencies and industry, there's kind of an adversarial relationship there. Absolutely. So, so what's your experience with that? Absolutely. So when we started this you know, 15 years ago, it was pretty much 100% adversarial because first of all, what's government doing cutting us money to cooperate, you know? And, and government has, has been top-down command and control and litigious. And, you know, it's usually lawsuits and everything else. And so it, it took a while to gain their trust. And, um, and thank heavens, you know, we approached a number of industries. DTE Energy was the first one. They said, we will take a risk and enter into a cooperative management agreement with you for 656 acres um, on the lower, on the western base of Lake Erie. And that helped open the door to get us started. So trust is a very, very important thing. The, uh, the attitude is changing for us because um, 
we have a track record of that uh, working with many partners, including industry and businesses, to do that. Um, but cooperative management agreements are an art form. You can imagine you enter into a set of principles that you both agree to, that you're going to agree to do certain things and uh, not get in each other's way, that you're both bring certain resources to the table. Um, but it's a pretty novel process. It's fairly new, especially if you think about it, how government has been command and control for so long. Yes? Maybe this is, I don't know, it's a little bigger question than just the Detroit area, but when you were talking about remediating polluted soil, for example, in this area, what, what ends up happening with that? I mean, are, is it simply some of the pollution gets transferred somewhere else where it's more confined, or so? I mean, if you're talking about contaminated sediment or contaminated soil, let's start with contaminated sediment. This $158 million, you know. In some cases, um, in the Great Lakes, for example, we have where uh, in Waukegan, Illinois, where you, there's PCB contaminated sediments. And they actually took those sediments and ran them through um, high temperature incineration, a, a mobile incinerator called Use. And it was um, it ran the sediments through 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit for a long period of time to break down those PCB molecules into something that's not harmful in the eye or other life forms. So that's one example. They've had uh, um, places where they have um, PCB contamination. They use something called a task process where they strip off. PCB molecules that are adsorbed onto the sediment particles and then take them to a task or facility for uh, safe treatment. In some cases, they physically remove them and put them in the containment cells. Uh, in some cases, uh, uh, they put them into a CDF, something called a confined disposal facility. In some cases, they put them into geotubes, these large like bags that water comes out of the bags that contains all the sediments that have contaminants absorbed on them, absorbed, and, and so it decreases the volume of sediment that it has to be treated or disposed. So it's a, it's, a, it's a range of techniques that are being used, but the primary one right now is taking it out of an uncontrolled environment like Detroit River, like Saginaw Bay, or like Hamilton Harbor, isolating it into a containment cell that has that is mined and that is capped that is much better than subject to a, a wind event or an ice scour event or something like that. In the, in the brownfield example, this refuge gateway that we worked on here, you can imagine um, a place where they made automotive brakes and paints for 44 years, what we would find when we started excavating. So, a couple of times we found barrels and we had to bring in US EPA and hazardous, hazardous waste response team and safely dispose of them in the hospital. Um, uh, one case we found an underground storage tank. We had to analyze what was in it, which thank heavens there was no liquid, and they had solidified it with a compound so we could recycle the steel. Um, uh, some cases we low level contamination. We could move it on site and cap it with four to six foot of clay and then put six inches of topsoil on it and grow trees. So there are no simple solutions to either of those for the contaminated sediment remediation, contaminated soil, and they're all expensive. But we're paying for what we did for many, many decades. Any other questions? Hearing none, that's it. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks.